In a world full of cinematic universes, you would think more studios would be looking to flesh out some already existing IPs. It's harder than ever to get something started from scratch, and to make a profit from that is even tougher. However, there's plenty of opportunity for new franchise-defining opportunities before the first major entry. Of course, I'm talking about prequels. We've already done one list concerning horror flicks that could benefit from some additional backstory, and now we're back to do another. If we were to generate a timeline for these lists, maybe imagine that this one happened 10 years before the last one and involved some major players before they were fully grown. Cool. Hello horror heads and welcome back to the scariest channel on YouTube, Top 5 Scary Videos. I'm your horror host, Keegan Hughes, and today we're counting down the top 5 scary horror movies that need a prequel, part 2. Before we get started, make sure you give this video a big thumbs up and subscribe for more prior things. Outstanding. Let's begin. Starting us off at number 5, we've got the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yes, we've got a smattering of different origin stories and backstories for Leatherface and company, but if we take it back to the very beginning, 1974, and look specifically at Toby Hooper's genre-defining classic, there's a lot of great stuff that I need to know more about. Everybody knows the best part of that movie is the family and what a family it is. So loving and caring and willing to extend a hand to those in need. We have the loving brother, hitchhiking lunatic, and the firm but warm gas station attendant. And who could forget the goofy old timer, dehydrated grandpa. And of course, there's the string that ties everyone together, the one, the only, Leatherface. What a great non-traditional family unit, supporting each other as best they can. I mean, there are a bunch of prolific killers living in the middle of bunk nowhere, but you can't help but wanting to know more. How do they fill their house so completely with sun-bleached animal bones? Where did they get all these great torture implements? How many people have they hitchhiked with and eventually kidnapped? A movie focusing on the family at an earlier time would be really freaking cool. Like, we could maybe see Granddad at his peak, serial killer extraordinaire before he became so decrepit teaching his sons how to become murderous lunatics just like the old man. Maybe detailing their first full family freakout, you know? Maybe the hitchhiker brings back some college kids but does a really sloppy job and they have to clean up afterwards. Or maybe Leatherface's first kill in which he fashions his famous skin mask. So much potential for backstory universe expansion. I think it would be best if it didn't take itself super seriously though. Wicked. Coming in at number four, we've got Tucker and Dale vs. Evil. On the topic of crazy hillbilly serial killers in the middle of nowhere, can we talk about Chad for a moment? If you haven't seen Tucker and Dale, this will technically be a spoiler, so if you don't want one of the best horror comedies of the past decade or so ruined, I'd skip ahead for now. So if you've seen Tucker and Dale, you know that a good deal of the story is revealed through exposition and flashbacks. Chad, the insufferable frat douche, has a hatred hard-on for hillbillies and hicks, all because of a purported attack on his parents and their friends some 20 odd years ago. But in a stunning twist of fate, it's discovered that Chad's dad was a bad lad who went mad. Egad. Our Kappa Sigma Dingus has all sorts of violent and maniacal tendencies thanks to his heredity, but this has all been seemingly ignored by everyone in his life up until this point. I guess being a wealthy frat boy affords you some leeway in terms of getting away with bad behavior. Who knew? So what I want to see is a Bates Motel style run up to Chad's inevitable breakdown into crazy serial killer. You know, showing him growing up and acting like a lunatic with his mom always stepping in to save his ass from real consequences. She knows the truth, but wants to protect him from it. She's got to shelter her special little boy. So he gets away with everything and starts thinking that acting like his then unknown father is a normal and fine thing to do. These seeds of evil have been sown and now it's time to germinate. Watching a killer become a killer would be fascinating and if done with the same genre bending self-aware wit as Tucker and Dale vs. Evil, it could be a hilarious watch. You know, setting up deadly traps in the schoolyard and saying it was just a science project, or kidnapping people and claiming it was an honest misunderstanding. By the time Chad's in college, he's a full-blown sociopath, but damn does he throw a tight spiral and throw a hell of a kegger too, so let's let him get away with it. We could call it evil in a time before Tucker and Dale, or, you know, something better than that. Rolling into number three, we've got The Shining. Tell me right now that you don't want to see a pre-Johnny Overlook Hotel and I'll call you a liar. Imagine it, a full recounting of the previous family to take up winter residence here. The twins, the blood, the insanity, and be wicked. And that's just one option for a Shining prequel. The Overlook has one hell of a history and many ghosts haunting its halls. We could meet the lady in the tub before she got so extremely gross. Or we could figure out what the hell was going on with that dog man, although maybe that one's best left on its own. Hell, we can even follow the bartender if he ever really existed. What terrible fate befell any of the previous patrons? And if that's not enough, we could find some more people with The Shining. 
We know there are more individuals with a supernatural talent, whether it be folks from Doctor Sleep or the Overlook's off-duty groundskeeper. Danny was not the first to realize his powers and definitely won't be the last. So by heading back in time and examining the life and times of historic Shining users, we could gain a lot of insight into the power and its origins. I don't want to speculate too far because I'm not one-tenth the writer Stephen King is and not even one one-hundredth the filmmaker Kubrick is, but I think these are some good jumping off points. Coming in at number two, we've got The Ritual. While the movie itself does have a self-contained backstory told through really creative flashbacks, I think there's a lot more to explore here. Namely, the origin of the cultist village in the forest. Let's make a period piece akin to the witch examining the humble beginnings of a terrifying commune. You know, like someone getting exiled from the larger society and retreating out in the middle of nowhere. Soon, strange happenings are discovered and family members start acting strange before disappearing. It all becomes clear that something is out in the woods, causing all sorts of terrible mishaps. At first, we don't see much, and people deny any sort of supernatural element, but then its presence becomes undeniable and even somewhat comforting. It doesn't take the folks long to realize that they can potentially negotiate with it, and by negotiate, I do mean treat it like a god and make sacrifices. Rituals can be developed, demands will be bowed to, innocent souls will be corrupted, you know the deal. The village in the ritual is just so cool and full of the kind of hyper-specific details that I want expanded. Now, how do they come up with their rituals? How many generations of people lived here? What benefits did they gain from the monster? Is it the only one of its kind? All done up in muddy grays and browns, it could be a bleak, terrifying, slow burn of a horror movie. And finally, crashing in a number one, we've got Cabin in the Woods. Do I even need to explain this one? There's so much potential here, it's crazy. Like a government agency controlling hundreds, if not thousands of horror movie antagonists in some high-tech monster containment facility to appease angry gods? Come on. You can make a movie for each of the insane creatures kept in the plexiglass cages. The Merman, the Cenobite Clone, the Zombie Family, the Weird Insane Doctors. Like every single one of these could star in their own movie. And depending on your headcanon, they probably already did. It boggles the mind to consider all the crazy creatures and killers. Even better, there could be like an X-Styles file show about the organization discovering, tracking, and capturing each instance. Like they had to get into that underground facility somehow. And they're not just out there waiting patiently to be found. No, they are killing folks in their natural habitats. The potential is truly limitless. I wanna know where the dismemberment goblins came from. Hell, I just wanna talk about the dismemberment goblins more. Anyone here a fan of dismemberment goblins? Now that I've planted the idea in your head, let's move on to a couple other ones. Of course, we could find the origins of the less than benevolent gods. Sure, they're actually just a thinly veiled metaphor for the horror audience at large, but imagine if there was a real backstory. We could find out how they first contacted humanity and why they want horror movie tropes to play out in order to be satisfied and how their demands grew over time. Lots and lots of fun to be had with these details. Lastly, it would be very interesting to see a movie about the special agents running the show. They're just so goofy and fun. I want to see them start out at the agency and work their way up the ranks. Developing new techniques to make teens suffer, pulling pranks on each other, you know, starting rivalries between other people in similar positions, the works. For such a shadowy organization, there's a lot of little details and hints that could be developed further. Man, what is that, like two movies in a TV series? Start writing, people. Ah, uh, it's always a fun time, eh? Speculating and pontificating about some of my favorite movies. So what do you think of the list? You want to buy the rights to any of these franchises so you can develop my ideas? What's that? You want to pay me to write horror movie concepts? Please do. Make sure you keep me in the loop down in the comments. Speaking of comments, let's take a look at some of your more fleshy ones from the top five SCP monsters that can never escape, part 16. Alex Curtis says, one of my favorite SCP-001s is the one describing how the Foundation attempted to discover a unified theory on anomalies and accidentally discovered that they're fictional constructs dancing at the whims of a group of horror writers. Very meta. How many walls are in this room again? One, two, three, four. Satan asks, Okay, I'ma comment this until you answer because I'm really curious. Keegan, are you into metal? Or rock? If so, what are some of your faves? By the way, love your content. You and Lucy are the reason I got into SCPs. I'm more into punk and punk and Jason stuff. Lately, I've been really into Dogleg, The Dirty Nil, and of course, my Canadian boys pup. Glad you're enjoying the stuff we put out. Goopin of Gloopus says, May I ask, have you seen a large Russian man with purple eyes and giant crab legs spreading from his shoulders? He's one of my eldritch brethren and I haven't seen him in millennia. Oh, yeah, Fyodor. <laughs> yeah, I think he moved back in with his parents in Jersey. The recession's hitting him pretty hard. James Hughes says, Guess you can't do a top 10,000 SCP monsters in one shot. Not unless I had a lot more resources than I do now and the ability to stay awake for indefinite periods of time. Cheryl Thomas says, all I can focus on is that shirt. Where do you get that ale? Bone Shaker, it's from Amsterdam Brewery in Toronto. You can get it all over Ontario, but no guarantees. That's all the time we have for today. Before I have a lovely hemlock cocktail, make sure to give this video a big thumbs up and subscribe for more movies and murder. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.